Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Johnny Coker. It's harvesting season in southern New Mexico, and that means it's chili roasting season. Today, I'm gonna to be talking with the Chili Pepper Institute's Dr. Paul Bosland about the intricacies of the New Mexico chili. But first, KRWG's Courtney Hill brings to us this story on Farm Mesilla, a farm to table operation showcasing products grown in the Mesilla Valley. So take a look. Pharmacia, the idea of Pharmacia is to have a local farm-to-market store that really tries to promote New Mexico items and specifically locally grown items. So we get, depending on the time of year, we try to carry a wide variety of New Mexico grown products. Uh, we also carry a lot of items that are produced in New Mexico, whether that be wines or beer, chili products, uh, different nut products, different candies that are could be from Albuquerque, Taos, Santa Fe, Las Cruces. And so this was kind of where the idea came from is we're sitting here selling it all over the country, but we don't have a lot of local alternatives here. So that's kind of where the idea came from. Oh man, we have, we have a wide variety of people that come in. We have locals that are in here. Um, three or four times a week. We have people that um, stop at the various campgrounds located close by. People are in Mesilla, Snowbirds. Um, it's really a unique mix of people and uh, we enjoy hearing the stories and talking to them all. We have different clubs and people that come and have uh, meetings here every week. And so, yeah, it's just a, just a nice little meeting place where people can have a, uh, something to snack on and get a drink and uh, enjoy the beautiful New Mexico weather. I think what I want people to, first of all, I want the customers to have a first-rate experience. I think our staff does an excellent job. Um, we want to make sure that the customer is completely satisfied with a pleasant staff, with great products, and just an overall great experience when they're here. That's, that's what we're focused on is really the customer experience of being here and experiencing all the different things that New Mexico has to offer. So this is a medium variety, it's called Charger. So you can see it's good, meaty, this is a medium heat level and uh, great Riano chili. So if you're wanting Rianos, this is a good, good, good chili to make Riano out of. We, uh, we offer pre-orders if they're turned in by Wednesday. Otherwise, it's just first come, first serve, walk in. You ready? So see what we're trying to do now is cool it off so that way it doesn't, it stays firm. I'm a big chili riano guy. They come out, they're ready to, they're, they're ready to eat, ready to go. In fact, I'll give it a try. Excellent. And now joining us in studio is Dr. Paul Boslin, former director of the Chili Pepper Institute here at New Mexico State University. Dr. Boslin, thanks so much for coming in the studio today. My pleasure. I love talking about chili peppers. Oh, I would hope so. And as, as the chili man, yeah. um, can you tell us about the founding of the Chili Pepper Institute and uh, where it's grown since its humble beginnings? Sure. Um, back in when I first started, uh, chili peppers weren't a big item in the United States, but we still got people asking about chili information and stuff, and this was before the internet, and so we actually get letters and such. And so we decided to promote chilies here because basically New Mexico State University is famous for its chilies. Uh, people don't realize that Fabian Garcia, our very first horticulturist here, 
develop the New Mexican pod type that is the basis of really what in those days was called Mexican food. So we started the Chile Institute in 1992. We're a research institute in the College of Agriculture. And um, we have different functions. We do a chili conference each year for the growers. We have a teaching garden and we have a little gift shop or a little uh, what we call a center for knowledge. Mm. And so can you tell me a little bit about the research projects done at the Institute? I mean, what are the key areas of focus and what, what makes it important, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, sure. Um, there's, we had um, up to 23 faculty members working on chili questions to solve them because we really are the center of the universe when it comes to chili research we do more chili research than any other university in, in the whole world and so we do diseases we do nutrition we do new varieties we do how to grow them and one of the latest things being um, looked at is the climate change how is that going to affect chili growing because uh, we've seen some yield decline we've seen some um, uh, difficulties growing the chili with a little warmer summers. Last year with the, the so many over 100 degree days, the chili's really suffered. People don't realize that once the temperature, air temperature gets over 95 degrees, chilies won't set fruit. So once it gets that hot, the farmer, the grower is not going to be, get any more fruit set. Mm. And, and so how does the climate go on to affect the tastes of the chilies? Because I know that does play a part in it while the plants themselves are somewhat sensitive to when they yeah, fruit, yeah, yeah. how does the stress affect the way, the, the profile of the sure. chili essentially? Sure, it's a very good question. Turns out that the stress does reduce our yield, but it makes them more flavorful. It the, uh, intensifies the flavor of chilies. So I, I like to use the example, if you grow the exact same variety here in Las Cruces or in San Diego, the fruit you pick here will be more flavorful than that in San Diego because the plant is suffering some stress here. But of course in San Diego they might yield more. So there's this give and take. And so what we've tried to do over the, the years is develop chilies that will yield well in this environment. So tell me a little bit about that. I know you have a display of chili here and that's a, what variety of New Mexico green chili is that right on top? This there? one is New Mexico 6-4. It was one of our very early varieties. And the interesting thing about that is that is the pod type that Fabian Garcia developed here. Before Fabian Garcia, there was no chili industry in New Mexico. It's hard to believe, but the only chilies that were being grown were in home gardens. And he decided if I made a new chili variety or pod type as we like to call them, would I get non-Hispanics to eat them? So mm -hmm. he developed this variety, released it, and it became a big hit. And so that started the canning industry for the green, the dehydration industry for the red chilies. And so it became our basis of our chili industry in New Mexico. Mm. And chili is obviously a big export of New Mexico. It is an economic driver, but it's also a very big cultural aspect of our state and being a part of the Chili Pepper Institute, I mean, how much does that cultural aspect um, center around the Chili Pepper Institute? Sure, sure. I think the, what I like about Chili Peppers, I say it crosses all age groups, all ethnic groups, and people usually put a smile on their face when they start talking about chili peppers. Everybody has a chili pepper story that they want to share. And so it's kind of a fun crop. Uh, the interesting thing is our, our chilies, if you think of them, they can be a vegetable, they can be a spice, they're a medicinal plant, plus they're an ornamental, and not very many of our crops have all those characteristics. Right, let's talk about the medicinal aspects. What kind of medicinal aspects could come from any specific chili pod? Sure, um, let, me, let me show you. This is the wild chiltepine. This is what chili peppers looked like before humans came in contact. And everything you see from this is what humans selected. And you have to think about it, the first human that goes up to this wild chili pepper plant bites it and it hurts them. It bites back, we say. And you wonder, why would humans want to eat something like that? Well, it turns out it was probably a painkiller. Uh, we know that the Aztecs in, in, uh, used it as a toothache medicine. And even today you can buy uh, liniments or creams or ointments that have chili heat in it to rub on to, to, to reduce pain. What happens is your body feels that chili pepper pain and it wants to protect you. So your body produces endorphins and endorphins are a pain blocker. 
So the endorphins become a uh, part of that reaction when you eat the chili peppers or rub the chili pepper heat and it blocks the pain. I always like to say you put a little pain to get rid of the big pain. I see. And, and you know, being from southern New Mexico, living here pretty much my whole life, I've heard anecdotes of, you know, if you have the flu or a cold to burn it out with some hot green chili stew. Is, is that just anecdotes or do, is there research to back that up? Is it just the endorphins that go through your head well, while you're sick? It, it's probably a complex thing. My wife is a native New Mexican and she truly believes that when you have the cold or flu, you need to have a bowl of green chili stew. It's gonna clean out your sinuses, your nose is gonna run. And so that's true, that's happening. But also it, it, I think it just it, um, builds up your immunity when you start to eat chilies. Mm. And let's, I, I wanted to talk about the flavor profile a little bit because you've described in the past uh, that chilies, it, it's similar to wine in that it is a very complex flavor profile in many ways, a, a developing, a developed taste, an acquired taste. So can you just tell me about like the aspect, like what aspect goes into tasting a chili, like what are we looking for when we taste them? Very, very good question. And as you look around the world, all the different chilies, those were selected for some kind of a flavor component, plus what I call a heat profile. And at the Chili Institute, we did the Chili Pepper Institute cookbook, which goes through all the different chilies and talks about the flavor and how they're used in different recipes around the world. And so what we like to tell people is, it's, it's like you say, a wine's a good analogy. The first time you drink wine, alcohol is all you notice. But then you notice the difference between red and white wine. And the same thing with chilies. I think most people would say, yeah, bell pepper tastes is different than a jalapeno, and a jalapeno tastes is different than a New Mexican type. And that's one of the areas that we're doing research on is what are those flavor components? We don't know the actual compounds that make the taste or the flavor. And so we'd like to know that. So as we breed, we can make chilies more flavorful. I see. And so you brought in a variety of hot sauces mm -hmm. here. This is the holy jalokia. This is the barbecue sauce. sauce. So if I were to try this, first of all, how hot would it be on like a skit or I guess Scoville units? What's yeah, it yeah, it's it's probably around 5000, okay. which is a hot. And, and this is a very good example of flavor when we 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 had um, uh, K. John Foods, John and Sue Hart come and visit us and they wanted to do something for us. And we had just discovered the Bucciolochi or ghost pepper. And they said, oh, we want to make you a hot sauce. And I said, I don't want just a hot, hot sauce. I want something with flavor so people understand chili peppers have flavors. So they uh, came up with some different kinds of concoctions that you could say. They brought them to, we tasted them. We said, oh, this has good flavor and heat. And so then they made the barbecue sauce and then don't do too much, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> well, and then the bite. taco sauce. And so, um, and what you'll notice with these, this heat profile of the uh, Bucciolochia, it's a delayed heat, mm. and it's the back of your throat. Feeling all that. And it's gonna linger, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. So hopefully don't eat too much because you wanna keep talking here. But uh, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's um, so all these chilies, and then a jalapeno, you'll notice is on the tip of your tongue, and the New Mexican pod type would be a mid-palate heat. So when you eat salsas, you can kind of say, oh, I know what chilies they use. And then you can start to see these subtle flavors. Some are herbaceous, some have more uh, fruity flavor, citrus. Um, there's even one that has like an apple note to it. Mm. So all these chilies, we know there's more than 300 compounds that give the flavor to chili peppers from around the world. Mm. Well, I gotta say, the boot jalokia within, at least mixed in this barbecue sauce, is really good, uh, not too hot. Okay. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the boot jalokia okay. though. What goes in, because for a while, y'all held the hottest pepper in the world, essentially. Yep, the here Guinness in the Book Mexico. of Records. What's that? The Guinness Book of Records. Yes, in the Guinness Book of World Records. What goes in to the scientific aspect of developing the hottest chili pepper in the world? Like what research needs to be done? What type of breeding needs to be done? V very interesting question. We, we had heard in India there was a chili called Naga Jalokia that was supposed to be very, very hot. So we tried to get some seed to test it because everybody thinks they have the hottest chili, but we couldn't. But we actually had one of our chili heads was traveling through Assam. They said, we have a chili pepper called here called Boot Jalokia and it's as hot as the Naga. Would you like some seed? I said, sure, we'll grow it out and see. So we grew it out and it looked very hot. And so the next year we did replicated trials with controls and then uh, analyzed it with what's called high performance liquid chromatography, which is a very scientific way to measure the heat. 
and lo and behold, it hit 1 million Scoville heat units. A jalapeno is about 10,000 to put it in perspective. So now we had this 1 million um, uh, chili pepper. And so it was the hottest chili pepper in the world. Guinness gave us the um, certificate for that. And then lo and behold, I had a colleague in Trinidad, uh, Tobago say, um, we have a hotter one. And I said, we, and he said, did you want to taste, uh, test it? And I said, sure. So he sent us, and what he sent us was what they call the scorpion chili. And this is it here. And you can see like it has a little scorpion tail. And so we grew out and get it again in the replicated trials with controls. And lo and behold, some of those hit 2 million Scoville heat units. Wow. And, and so we've test when we've, we've never found anything hotter than the scorpion chili pepper when we do, you know, our replicated trials with controls. So this, to your knowledge, is the hottest pepper that you've ever dealt with. Yes, it is. So my follow-up question is why? Why? <laughs> why, why, well, why have a pepper this hot? That's a very that good question. That we can question. be just right. holding in our hands you know, right I, now. Um, it's because they're grown usually in poor regions of the world mm. and you, you don't need as many chilies to heat up a dish I of see. food. And actually in Guatemala, they have a, a chili there they call the seven soup chili because it, you can use it to heat seven soups. Wow, I never thought about that actually being the efficiency standpoint of having such a hot chili. Yeah. Um, what have you found in you know folks coming in just trying to eat the hottest chilies that they can? I'm sure there's that type of tourism. So what has your, been your experience? Like what are some horror stories maybe attached to that? Well, the, you know, every uh, you have to be careful and um, everybody's different. What you have to realize is even if you started eating chilies today, you may never be able to eat the scorpion because everybody's different. What we have is heat receptors, the same heat receptors that tell you a cup of coffee or tea is hot is what this chemical capsaicinoids attach to and send your brain a false signal that it's hot. And so if you have a lot of those receptors, you're really a connoisseur of chilies. You'll notice all the subtle heats. But if you don't have very many, you can eat really hot ones. Mm. And in my career, I'd met three people that had no heat receptors. What? They were like a bird. They could eat the hottest chilies and it was like a bell pepper. Interesting. I didn't realize there was a genetic aspect to that as well. So that, is there a way to, for people to get used to chili or maybe even numb their taste buds to it a little bit? Or is that just getting used to the heat? It, it, it's getting used to, and we don't know that there's two theories. One, it's like Pavlov's dog. You know you're gonna eat something hot and your body's starting to produce endorphins quickly. Others, maybe the receptors get um, kind of overused and so they can't send as many signals to the brain. I see. Well, tell me a little bit about the teaching garden because we talk about these chili pepper, this ch chili pepper tourism, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that's a big aspect of the teaching garden. But what else goes on there? Like, what is your pitch to the public about um, why? Well, what is the teaching garden? Yeah, why don't you here it's it's um, we have more than 140 different varieties of chilies from all over the world, and it's it's to try to explain about like you asked earlier about flavor all these different chilies, you know, the flavors and, and different cultures use them. And it's fun when some of our international students go out, they'll say, oh, there's my chili. Oh, that's my chili, Be relating back to their homeland. I see. And, and that is another cultural aspect of it is like, New Mexicans are obviously very attached to their chili, the New right. Mexico chili pepper. But I assume throughout the world that everyone has these, maybe not everyone, but there are certain cultures that just get attached um, you know, to their types of chilies. In your travels, what are some similar um, cultures to New Mexico in terms of maybe having that attachment to their spices and their I, chilies? I can give you a very good example. If you go to Peru, uh, Bolivia, they have what they call the ají. Very different chili, a different species, very unique flavors and aromas. And in, in, in Mexico, they have so many of their own, own types of chili, serranos, jalapenos, parcillas. They don't like that flavor. That's not what they like. But in Peru, Bolivia, that's the chili they want to eat. So they've gotten accustomed to these very specific heat profiles and flavors. Mm. And you're the chili man. And I, you know, your, your opinion is held very highly in this region. 
what is your favorite chili in terms of flavor profile, heat? Like, what is your, what's the perfect chili, Dr. Bosley? Uh, I've been asked that uh, probably a hundred <laughs> times or more. And I said, each, it's like having your children, which is your favorite <laughs> child. Well, you, they're all, you love them all. And I find with all the different chilies that there's so much variability that you can just use them in different ways. And, and so that's, I, I don't have a one specific, but I have specific chilies I like to use in certain ways. I see. What about the scorpion pepper? Where would you rate it on Oh, that? man. I mean, th that's just nastiness there. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it is, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have a lot of receptors, so, so a really hot chili like that is painful to me. Mm. Well, that's a ringing endorsement. Um, <laughs> what, what kind of flavor profile? We have this hot sauce here yeah, yeah. from the scorpion pepper. What flavor profile would one expect from the scorpion sure, pepper? Sure, sure. You're going to know, again, it's a little delayed. It'll be the back of the throat. And it's kind of what we would call a sharp heat, a prickly heat. There's two types. New Mexican chilies have what we call the flat heat, like it's been paint brushed on, where this one has a sharp heat, a prickly mm. heat. And it takes a little while. That's why I say never take the second bite or the second chip now. Wait till this one kicks in because otherwise it'll be too much usually. Yeah. No, it's hot. And it's I hot. feel it, it is. Uh, but it's not as bad as I was expecting, okay, honestly. Okay. It does a really good. Right. The sauce itself does a good job of mellowing it out. And you should have flavor. Consumer. That's the key here. Yeah. You know, the heat's just one component. You want the flavor too. So they combine to make that uniqueness of a chili pepper. I see. Do, do you find that... Um, do you find that, oh God, that is hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Uh, I'm sorry, give me a second. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what you need right now is a glass of milk. Milk is the best way to cut the heat. Mm -hmm. It's There's a protein in milk called casein that atta attaches to the receptors and blocks the signal to the brain. Um, water doesn't do much, mm. alcohol doesn't do much. And the next best thing is carbohydrates like sugars or breads. And so if we had some honey, that would help you. Uh, yeah. So um, Well, that's good to know now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so that, that's an educational point there too. No, that's good, that's good. So, so dairy specifically yeah, cuts I through mean, it? Yeah, ice cream's great. You know, at the chili eating contest, they usually give the contestants afterwards a little thing of vanilla ice cream because you get the sugar and the milk. Mm. Well. Just, uh, just to move on in the conversation a little bit, I think. What, what, um, what kind of collaboration does the Chile uh, Pepper Institute do within New Mexico State University and maybe even beyond within the local community? Well, we do outreach. Um, just uh, probably, I think, first week of October, we're uh, going to give a tour to the Hispanic uh, uh, group that's in t here that's going to go to the garden and do a salsa tasting. The Chile Conference, of course, is international. People from all over the world come to learn about the newest discoveries in chili peppers. And we've had a lot of professors from around the world come and do sabbaticals. And we've had a lot of international students who come here and then go back to help their country. Recently, we had a student from Thailand who's now a professor at the university in Thailand. Oh, wow. That's very cool. And, and we were talking a little bit about this, about the changing environment and the changing environment for the chilies. How, <laughs> how, how has the changing environment changed the way that chili is cultivated and the way that it's grown in our region? And how has the yield been this year specifically? This year has been very good. It seems a, it's a lot better than last year. Last year we had a, such a dramatic uh, heat uh, spell that the yields are down, the chili quality is bad. Chili sometimes get what we call blossom in rot, like on tomatoes, they get a brown spot. And once they get the brown spots, you can't harvest them. So even if you have a pot, it's just, but it's only got a little brown spot, it's, you can't pick it, there's no uh, yield there. I see. And so what kind of uh, research is the Institute doing in order to, you know, maybe figure out ways to grow these crops with using less water and, um, sure. and you know, essentially living in this new, not new environment, but a changing environment, ever changing environment. Well, two things. One is, is we're breeding for what we call water use efficiency, that you get more yield for, with less water or the same amount of water, but you get more yield. So you use less water to get the total yield. The other thing, Dr. Stephanie Walker, my student, who's uh, in, in the Plant and Environmental Science Extension Office, is looking at growing them under solar collectors. You have the solar collectors come, go, be, being put up all over New Mexico through shading, and maybe they can grow well under the shade. We found that when we grow chilies in, in 
our research plots and we have to isolate them from bees and insects so they don't cross pollinate and we put a cloth, a shade cloth over them, they actually do better. So they're very stressed here and so we, maybe growing under the shade of these solar collectors is the way we can do it. I see. And Dr. Boslin, I know the Chili Pepper Institute has a new location. I wanted to give you a chance to plug that. So can you tell us a little more about that? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, we've always been in Gerald Thomas uh, Hall building, and now we're going to be out the Fabian Garcia Science Center. That's 113 West University Avenue. So if you want to find it, you just head towards Mesilla. As soon as you cross the railroad tracks, that's the Fabian Garcia Science Center. So it has the Chile Institute Teaching Garden, and that's where the, the new um, kind of gift shop uh, education room will be. I see. Well, it was a pleasure to have you on the show today, and hopefully folks go to visit you at the new location of the Chili Pepper Institute. So yeah. thanks for coming on the show today. What should I expect if I bite into this right now? I'm, I'm, I've got to tell you, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do it. And, uh, but if you did, have some milk uh, handy so that you can maybe cut the heat. I see. Well, thanks so Thank much you. for coming yeah. on the show today. <laughs> That's all for today's episode. Remember, you can stay up to date on the latest local news at krwg.org. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Johnny Coker, and we'll see you next time on Fronteras, a changing America.